time to everyone. And uh, I welcome you to day two of the lectures. And we'll be starting off with uh, John and Tim Frick. Uh, you, many of you probably know them as uh, the men in black walking around town. Uh, John and Tim have been fixtures of the Mothman Festival uh, since its inception in 2003. Uh, among other things, they operate the uh, component of the uh, highway hayride where Mothman flies uh, at you. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, they've been an integral part of the festival since its beginning, and uh, uh, at this point, I think I'll just turn it over to John and Tim. Uh, welcome, guys. Hi everyone, thank you for coming to the Maltbean Festival and to our talk. Me and my brother have had many amazing experiences here in Point Pleasant area and at another paranormal hotspot in Pennsylvania and we'll be talking about some of these today. We're going to be speaking separately over the next hour. We will be talking about many different things including igloos, Indian mounds, time slips, and John Keel, author of the Maltbean Prophecies. Jeff, won, Jeff Wamsley wanted me to talk about Keel, so I decided to show some rare photos, some of which I got from his family. Oh, is, oh, is there somebody here to change the picture? I forgot this is not a clicker. <laughs> John's supposed to be there to change the next picture. Serpent Mound. 
the serpent man is believed by some to be over 2,000 years old. And this is the image of it. And there's like a, there's a path, a footpath that goes around it. At one end, the, the snake head is um, eating an egg. At the other end, his tail uh, goes into a spiral. It's a really interesting place. And if you haven't been there, it's, it's definitely worth visiting. In 2003, a very cool looking crop circle appeared in a field about a quarter of a mile from the Serpent Mound. I've talked to various people and many strange things were going on at that time. The night before the circle appeared, blue lights were seen flying around over the area. In the week that followed, a man snuck onto the mound at night and saw a large red UFO right over his head. Also about that time, paranormal investigator Neil Parks was in the field where the crop circle was and he encountered a very strange police officer that seemed to be a man in black. Neil wanted to be at this festival, but um, he had to pull out to the last minute and couldn't make it, unfortunately. So basically there was a rash of paranormal activity around that mound at that time. Pictured here we have a large Indian mound across the river from Ravenswood. Ravenswood, West Virginia. This is typical of the way most Indian mounds look, and uh, that's my brother on top of the mound. Here we have the tallest mound in the United States, the Great Creek Mound in Moundsville, West Virginia. It's about 70 feet tall. It's right across the street from the famous haunted prison in Moundsville. Unfortunately, there are no known photos in existence, but there were once small Indian mounds right here in Point Pleasant on the outskirts of town. They were about three or four feet tall and they were torn out in the early 1970s before laws protecting the mounds were passed. They were on the left as you leave town right near where the long white fence is. And um, Linda Scarberry and the gang, after they saw Mothman that night, were coming back into town. They stopped at Village Pizza, but um, before they got to Village Pizza, they saw a big dog alongside of the road here, right near where those mounds were. This mound is the closest one that I know to Point Pleasant. It's about six miles south of here in Galapagos, West Virginia. It's approximately six feet, feet tall. And above is um, a picture of an eaglo. When I first saw this mound in 2004, I was immediately struck by its, how similar it is to the igloo and the TNT area, both in shape and size. One's about 16 feet and one's like, um, the igloos are about 18 or 19 feet, but as you can see, they're very similarly shaped. This made me seriously wonder if there's a connection between them. In 2007, I got to appear on the Maltman episode of Paranormal State, and I got to talk with super psychic Chip Coffee. Chip said the energy he was felt coming off the igloos is like anything he had ever experienced. He didn't like going into the igloos because um, they kind of gave him a headache. I told him my theory about how the igloos closely resembled Indian Mound and how they may be stirring up paranormal energy. And he agreed that I was right. And he said that he felt that there was a grid and a shape and entire layout of the igloos was done that way by the military intentionally. At the time, Chip had not seen this map of the Eagle area of TNT, which is laid out like a grid. <laughs> Many strange things have happened in this area. Each one of the circles that you see it's too bright to show the laser pointer but each one of the circles you see up there it represents an eaglo the road in the middle represents potter street road and most people walk to the igloos on the south side that's where um eagle road number seven and um, eagle number two is the red X on the upper left represents where the Ralph Thomas house once stood. This was where Marcella Bennett saw the Maltman rise up in the yard and she fell, fell while holding
holding her baby. The road I highlighted in blue on the lower right, on the lower left, uh, me and my brother had two unusual sightings there, one by um, me and my brother and her best friend, and one by uh, my brother and a friend. On August 18th, 2002, this is not a this is not a photo. Um, this is a um, something I did in Photoshop, but it represents what me and my brother saw. We went to um, Point Pleasant for the first time on August 18, 2002, and we found an igloo on Igloo Road Number One, and we were in the TNT area for like 15 minutes, and then all of a sudden we saw this thing shooting across the sky. It had a bright white head and red flames shooting out the back. It was um, pretty amazing. And uh, me, Tim, and our good friend Ian all saw it. Five years later, we were back on Igloo Road number one, this time with our friends Brian Haley and John Casey. Tim and Brian walked about a third of a mile down the road, and me and the other John stayed back on the main road. While we were separated, Tim and Brian saw another shooting star-like object. This one was blue and white, and the tails trekked across the most of the sky. It was far more spectacular than the sighting from five years before. Somehow me and my friend John both missed it. Both super amazing shooting star-like objects were seen on the same Eagle Road in the TNT area five years apart. I would do a um, computer mock-up of it, but I didn't see it, so I, you know, I can't really um, guess what it looked like. But um, it, st it stretched like from one side of the sky to the other, or most, most of the sky. This next picture was taken by my investigator friend Emily in, two th in early 2008. It was taken in igloo number one on road number seven. Back then there was a bunch of um, aluminum cans in there. They've since been removed, but there's still some um, old dirty cans in there. As can be seen, there seems to be some sort of entity manifesting in the photo. This is one of the more interesting pics from an igloo that I've ever seen. A solid object or lake seems to be showing here, but you can see the floor of the igloo right through it. And that goes up and it seems to be um, some sort of helmet or something up here. This next photo was taken in igloo number two on road number seven. This time me, Tim, and our friend Brian were investigating with our friends Emily, CJ, Heather, and Dustin. The photo was taken by Emily just after CJ said, there is something here, take pictures. This photo, which is a two second time exposure, so you can see both CJ and Heather moving during the shot. This was taken by Dustin of Emily taking CJ's picture. So this is a picture of, of Emily taking a picture of CJ. As you saw in a previous picture, it was just CJ pointing. But this is, so you have two pictures of the same instant. And it was, since it was a two second time exposure, you see both CJ and Heather have moved slightly. The strange thing is, it's that some sort of shadow entity seems to have appeared in the picture. These legs don't belong to anyone. There's a shadow of legs that belong to anyone in the igloo, and it seems to be a cloaked, a short cloaked figure. And this shadow up here is CJ, so it kind of almost merges together. We we were um, all kind of weirded out um, when when this picture was taken because um, they noticed it on the screen as soon as it was taken. And um, we also had the Frank's box running at the front of the igloo. And um, the Frank's box seemed to say, get out at that time. It said, get out. This is um, an enhanced version. It, so you can see the details in the shadow being a lot more. And it looks like there's a face right in there. And it, that was kind of looks like it's looking straight towards Emily over here. One of the strangest events to ever happen in the TNT area happened the night before the festival in 2007. 
Me and Tim arrived at Eagle Road number seven with four friends around quarter after 11. The first thing we noticed when we got there was a car parked at the guardrail. We also saw flashlights way down the road and assumed that the car belonged to those people. We then headed up to Eagle Road number two and hung out there for a while. Our friend Jeff was creeped out by the igloo and so he waited outside. We then headed back to our cars and when we got back to the cars, the car that had been there was gone, but none of us had seen the people go by us. The only other way for them to get to their car was for them to walk over a mile to go around the back, which seemed very unlikely that they could have done it in that time or you know, why would they even do it? The strangest part of all this is that the next night I found that my friend, Rosemary Ellen Golly, met in to me in the lobby of the Lowe Hotel around 11.40 Friday night while I was physically in Igloo number two. Of course, I have no recollection of having been in the Lowe Hotel at that time or ever having had the conversation that Rosemary recalled. We do not know what sort of strange phenomena happened that night, but between the vanishing car and Rosemary speaking to another version of me, we think something may have been going on with parallel realities. Steve. <laughs> We experienced other odd things in the TNT area over the years, as have many other people. There is definitely something strange going on there, which seems to be linked to the igloos. This closes my portion of the talk. Thanks for listening. Here's my brother, Tim. Some of mine and my brother John's strange experiences, many of them took place in a remote area of North Central Pennsylvania, and one of them happened in Point Pleasant. I'd like to begin by quoting something from John Keel's book, The Mothman Prophecies, that was published in 1975. Keel wrote, a family in the south of England still spend their weekends driving around woods looking for a mysterious lake they encountered some 15 years ago. Out in the middle, they saw a huge rock with a sword driven into it. Later, they went back to do some research, but there was no trace of such a lake. No one had heard of it and it isn't on the maps. I read the Mothman prophecies back in 1991 and I particularly remember Keel writing about the sword stuck in the boulder and in the middle of the lake, out in the middle of the lake. However, I also recall that Keel mentioned the source of this material and that it came from a book called The Green Stone. Upon reading this, I scribbled down some notes on a piece of paper, and the next time I went to look at the passage in the Mothman Prophecies, there was no mention of the book called The Green Stone. Next picture? Okay. Previous picture, sorry. This right here is the note that I scribbled down. Uh, it, it's kind of chicken scratch. It says uh, Excalibur. Oh, sorry. Here's the, here's the uh, note I scribbled down to the first, it's a word at the top is Excalibur, then it says 170, then the green stone. Uh, next picture. And I know it's hard to see, but this, this right here is page 170 of the Mothman Prophecies. Uh, for, for those of you who have really good vision, you might be able to make out the page number up top. And it mentions the, the, the passage I quoted to give my talk. That's like in the middle of the page, but and down below is where I saw the um, the mention of the green stone. Yet when I went back to look later, it wasn't there. <coughs> Regarding the note I'd written, it was missing either weeks or months months after I had written it, and it had remained lost until last year when I found it while going through some of my old papers on the day before Thanksgiving. The note had been lost for 24 years, and when I did a search on the internet for the Green Stone, I came across a book by Graham Phillips and Martin Keatman. Next picture. What did they say? Uh, right here is the picture of the book, The Green Stone. Interestingly enough, Excalibur is mentioned in this book, and it, is all, it also talks about a lake in England that's been around since medieval times, and the lake is called Knight's Pole. Most interesting of all, however, is the book The Green Stone was first published in 1983. So how, in 1975, can John Keel mention a book that wasn't even printed until eight years later? This is truly a paradox, and there's no way to scientifically explain it. 
on page 170 of the Multiman Prophecies, John Keogh refers to such things as distortions in reality. Strange things like this happen from time to time, yet they can't be rationally explained. Next photo. And this right here is uh, the Eye of Fire, which is the sequel to the Green Stone. Okay, uh, next picture. Okay, this has to do with the, uh, the beam of light that John and I encountered in uh, North Central Pennsylvania on Route 120 on uh, August 7, 2005. Uh, next photo. My brother John and I began camping up in North Central Pennsylvania in 2004, and over the years we've experienced a lot of strange things up there. Between a town called Renova and the turn off to Cinnamon State Park is a 24 mile stretch of road called Route 120. Back on the evening of August 7, 2005, it had, remained, it had rained earlier in the day and there was a light mist covering the road. Well, John and I were driving on Route 120 when we saw a beam of light right in the middle of the road, and we drove right through it. We don't know if the shaft of light had any depth to it, but from what we remember, it had straight, well-defined edges and was about four feet wide and went down roughly to the ground. We each confirmed what we saw and as soon as we could, we found a place to turn our vehicle around and drove back to the area, but we, the shaft of light was gone. And that right there was a picture of, uh, it wasn't the exact same stretch of the road, but that was part of Route 120. Next picture. All right, this has to do with uh, mine and my brother John's uh, experience about when we were impersonated by the men in black. This, uh, took place on November 4, 2006. On Friday, November 3, 2006, John and I went to a convention in Northeastern Ohio. That night, we stopped by the house of a female friend of ours named Shirley and talked to her for about half an hour. The next day, November 4th, we got on Interstate 80 and headed east to Toledo. And while we were on the interstate, we saw a white van come up behind us, then pass us. As this vehicle passed, we saw that the van had slightly shaded windows, and through the windows we, we could see through, sorry, and through the windows we could see three, three or four men in black in three-piece suits, though we didn't notice if any of them had sunglasses. Okay, next picture. Okay, this right here, I took uh, some pictures off real discreetly on the dashboard. And this is uh, one of the photos of the white van. Uh, next picture. And here's a more closer shot. While all of this was happening, John and I were a little leery that the people in the vehicle could be men in black. And we thought it was particularly strange when we saw the van's license plate. The plate number was 111L. And over top the number, it, it read unregistered vehicle. Also, this vehicle stayed within sight of us for at least a half hour, either in front of us or behind us, and we passed each other several times. As some of you may know, my brother John and I regularly dress up as the Men in Black during the Maltman Festival, as well as at other conferences we go to. Well, I thought I would point out that as of November 2006, John and I had played the Men in Black at the Maltman Festival twice and had appeared on one multi documentary as the MIB. About a week later, about a week after leaving Toledo and driving back home, Shirley sent John an email asking if we had been back in the area since, uh, uh, since, since the week before. And John told her that we hadn't. She then told my brother that a few nights ago, while she was out walking her dog, a vehicle pulled up into the church parking lot across the street from her house, and two tall men got out, and she watched them. At first, she thought they were me and John, but after she noticed that they were walking funny, she didn't, wasn't really sure. Shirley then saw 
that they were watching her and this gave her the creep. So she went back inside her house and watched them from behind closed blinds. Shortly afterward, another vehicle pulled into the parking lot and then me and got out and talked to the two men and who were already there. Then the three people got into their vehicles and drove away. The next day, Shirley was looking at a baby monitor that she was planning to sell and decided to see if it worked. Now, there's, there's something about baby monitors that allow them to pick up calls made by portable phones. And while she was checking out the baby monitor, she heard something quite interesting. What she heard was a conversation between two of her neighbors where, where one told the other that her son had seen some suspicious activity in the church parking lot. So he pulled into the lot and asked the two guys uh, what they were doing. Well, the baby monitor surely then heard that the two mysterious figures told her neighbor's son that their names were Tim and John, they were paranormal investigators. Well, whatever, whoever they were, they weren't me and John. When John told me this story, I was blown away and said, wow, we impersonated the men in black and now they're impersonating us. <laughs> Most people would really be freaked out by this, but I look at it as a badge of honor. Back in the late 60s, the men in black impersonated John Keel in Point Pleasant. Now they were, now the MLB were posing as, uh, sorry, but I lost my spot there. Now the MIB were posing as us. I think that's pretty cool. All right, next photo. Right okay, this has to do with the uh, George B. Stevenson Dam time slip. It happened on uh, June 30th, 2007. A little earlier, I mentioned the phrase distortions in reality, which Keel used in his book, The Mothman Prophecies. Another term I have heard used to describe this phenomenon is time slips. Back on June 30, 2007, while in North Central Pennsylvania, John and I experienced some strange, something strange that has, that, sorry. We experienced something strange that may have been a time slip, but we're not quite sure what to think about it. Between June 2004 and October of 2006, my brother and I had visited the cinema honing area of North Central Pennsylvania a total of eight times. And every time we would drive by the George B. Stevenson Dam. When we were there, we would go around, go across the dam and walk down the gravel road on, used for utility, utility vehicles on the other side of the dam. We went to the dam. And I remember saying to John, that's weird. The road just then ends at the base of the mountain. Why don't they do something with this? Uh, that right there is the uh, gravel road that stretches off uh, to the, the base of the mountain. Sorry about that. Well, in June of 2007, when we went to George B. Stevenson Dam and walked to, to the base of the mountain, we discovered that the road wrapped around and went down to a lakefront. When I saw this, I said, cool. They finally did something with the road that, that it doesn't fit into the base of the mountain anymore. Later, later on, I went and talked to one of the park rangers and I asked, I asked them, when was the road for, put in at, at George B. Stevens at the end that goes down to the lakefront? I fully expected the park ranger to tell me that it was put in over the winter or over the last couple months. And I was stunned when uh, the person told me that the road was put in when the dam was first built back in the 1950s. How is this possible? I have a clear recollection of the road not being there, and I also remember having made the comment to John to about the road dead end at the base of the mountain. Uh, right here is uh, see the bend in the road. This right here on the right is where the road originally like ended. And I, I actually, when I took this picture, I walked around and I took the picture of, of the end of the road where it, it stretched out to the dam. Uh, next picture. Okay, this right here is uh, the George B. Stevenson Dam and there's the lake. Uh, next picture. Okay. Okay. 
in the book, The Mothman Prophecies, John Keel tells about window areas where strange phenomena come into our reality from another dimension until he thought Point Pleasant, West Virginia was one of them. Well, considering all the weird things John and I have experienced in North Central Pennsylvania, I think it's safe to say that region is one of the strange window areas. During August of 2008, John and I were camping up in North Central Pennsylvania with a friend of ours, Steve, who's a real life mountain man and once spent several months alone in the mountains living off the land. We were camped out near the head of a hiking trail called Pepper Hill Trail, which is about a 20 minute drive from the George B. Stevenson Dam. And it was on the night of August 15th that we heard something we would never forget. Our friend Steve was sleeping in the front of his pickup truck and John and I were in our tent in the, in the middle of the night. Uh, John woke me up. Uh, next picture. Okay, right there we have uh, the sign saying Pepper Hill Trail. It's like, it's like a trail marker. Uh, next picture. And that right there, I, I, I don't think I took this the very next morning, but during one of our times up at Pepper Hill Trail, I did take this picture. This is a Pepper Hill Trail look, looking down the trail. Upon waking, I heard something screaming out in the woods. And whatever it was, it, it didn't sound like an animal, but it didn't sound human either. The screaming we heard sounded angry and went on for about two minutes. This spooked me and John, and we could hear the screaming coming from different areas around the tent, leading us to believe that something was circling our campsite. The following morning, Steve told us that he had heard the screams too and said that he had never heard anything like it before. Also, while we were packing up our tent, we heard whooping sounds coming from the woods around us. And Steve told us that's how the Bigfoot creatures communicate with each other, letting them know the humans are in the area. Next picture. Okay, this has to do with the uh, the spherical object um, that, I, I, that showed up in one of my pictures when we, while we were visiting George B. Stevenson Dam in September of 2010. Uh, next picture. Okay, you can all see the, the white dot out in the sky that led to an anomalous object that turned up in our picture. On Saturday, September 4, 2010, John and I drove up to North Central Pennsylvania with a friend of ours named Mark. We had gone camping and hiking and while we were in the area, we had to go by George B. Stevenson Dam. It had been a busy weekend and it was, it was on Monday Labor Day that we finally found time to, to go visit the dam. We were there for only about 15 minutes and while at the time I took set, and while there I took, set, uh, took about uh, four to five pictures with my digital camera. I didn't notice anything unusual about any of the photos until I got home and loaded them onto my computer. In one of the pictures I took at the DM was this anomalous object, the, uh, the white object in the sky there. When I first saw it, I noticed the motion blur and thought it might be a UFO. And while I showed it to John, he thought that it was a UFO too. However, when I showed the photo to my friend and fellow paranormal investigator, Brad Oldham, he thought that it was interesting and asked if he could send it to a, a friend of his and to do a photo analysis of one. I then told him that I tend not to take things uh, personally when it comes to having some people do analysis of my photos. Well, when Brett's friend, well, when Brett's friend got back to me, his conclusion was that the object was not a UFO, but was something more interesting. He told me that he thought the white spherical object on the photograph was a <laughs> dimensional portal. 
when I heard this, it made perfect sense to me. Since it would explain the time slip at the DM and all the other weird happenings that John and I experienced while in North Central Pennsylvania. Oh, next picture. Okay, this had to do with the mysterious TNT water tanks. Um, this happened on September 20th, 2010. Prior to the 2010 Maltman Festival, John had heard about some water tanks that were adjacent to Camp Conley Road and we made a point to go check them out. Now these tanks were large, standing 20 feet high and 145 feet wide. And they supplied water to the TNT area while the that government facility was in use. The weekend of the Maltman Festival came and went, and it was on September 20th, the Monday just after the festival. That was again. And John and I planned to go check out the tanks. There's a narrow path just off Camp Conley Road, so we parked our vehicle nearby and began following the trail after a 20 minute walk we came to the tanks. John and I, John and I finally arrived at the water tanks after about 20 minutes. At first we saw two of them and they even circled the first tank finding no doorway in or out. There were three huge concrete water tanks. I then pulled out my digital camera and took several pictures of the tanks. And just show their scale, I John the, the picture of me standing next to one of them. Also, there was five feet of space between each tank, and I recall that both John and I tried to view the sky between the first and second tanks, but, but we couldn't because there was too much foliage. We then tried to view the sky between the second and third tanks, and we couldn't see the sky. Well, these tanks are pretty cool, I thought, and after a short while, we walked back to our vehicle and headed home. That night, once we got home, Sean looked on Google Earth and found the tanks. This time, however, there were only two of them. When John told me this, I figured the program was wrong and that it had a glitch in it, but John, John seemed convinced that it was right. Well, there was only one way to confirm the number of tanks, and that was to go back to Camp Conley Road and go back to the water tank and see for ourselves. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> So six weeks later, we went back to Point Pleasant and tracked back to the water tanks. And, and there, and what we found was, was earth shaking because there was only two tanks. Okay, next, next picture. Right here is an image of the two water tanks from overhead that I got from uh, Google Maps. Uh, next photo. And this right here uh, is an aerial photo of the two tanks. And I'm guessing that. Had there been thir three tanks, the, the third tank would be in the, the lower left-hand corner right there. And uh, next photo. And this is uh, one, one of the pictures of the tanks that I talked about was there. What the heck is going on, I thought, when John and I, when John and I remember seeing three tanks, but now there were only two. How is this possible? I then remembered what John Keel wrote in the Maltman Prophecies and how he referred to it as a window area. Whatever phenomena was allowing creatures like the Maltman Bigfoot Thunderbirds and the Men in Black to visit our world and other to, from visit our world from other dimensions. Was also changing our reality to somehow become unstable. <laughs> we 
we, we have used EMF out at, out at the igloos on the road number seven, and we have uh, come across some weird anomalies out there. Oh, that's yeah. Is it possible that Um, we saw two tanks as we were walking up the road through the woods, and when we got to the space, parallel to the space between the first and second tanks, there was like trees growing up. I was trying to see if, if the tanks were joined or if there was a space between them, and I couldn't tell because there was too much woods, so I decided to walk up to the point between tank number two and tank number three to see if I could see the space between those tanks and we could, that implies that there was a third tank. So it seems that there really were three tanks. Also, when John, when John and I first saw the two tanks, we kind of, like, if you were, you were to go there today, the, the, we, we, we were on the trail and the trail kind of wrapped around and you see two tanks, you know, right as you enter the trail and John was walking ahead of me. And he said, there's another one. Now, why would John say, there's another one if you could see Two ready as you step on the trail, and uh, we actually both remember trying to view the sky between the first and second, and we couldn't because there was so much foliage. But then we went uh, to the space between the second and third tanks, and we could see the sky between the second and third tanks. Okay, thanks. All right, welcome. Any other questions? You should ask if at another yeah. time period there will be. We're talking about time stuff. We pretty much both think that Mothman is paranormal in nature, something along the lines of something coming in from another dimension or a talpa or maybe even like an omen of death or something along those lines. Not um, like we don't think at all that it's like a mutated bird or a mutated human because it's physically impossible for a human sized creature to have a 10 foot or 12 foot wingspan and be able to fly, much less fly at like 80 or 90 miles an hour. So it's something paranormal, we're pretty sure. Yes? What drew you initially to the Georgia and Stevenson Hill Creek area? I'll figure this one. There's a book called, I can't really recall the title. Forbidden Land. It's, it was a paperback book released in the early 90s, and in it, it talked about uh, the north, north central Pennsylvania cinema honing type area and how like a lot of mysterious stuff happened in there. Plus, uh, our friend Steve, uh, who I uh, not not our buddy Steve here at the festival with us today, but the uh, our buddy Steve told us about um, Steve's is, Steve is a pseudonym. Yeah, it's a pseudonym. I don't want to reveal the person's real name. Anyway, he had told us about he, uh, him going camping in, up in um, the north central Pennsylvania area around George B. Stevenson Dam and how he'd seen like strange lights in the sky, you know, possibly UFOs and had, he had other weird encounters. So that right there told us that, well, this place might be like uh, Point Pleasant, like Point Pleasant's a window area. This place also might be a window area too. That's how we were drawn to it. Um, I think you later, Jerry. I'm not sure. Um, all I know is that people have seen UFOs in the vicinity and a man in black appeared up here near where a crop circle and where um, one of the mounds was. So it's unclear, but in my opinion, I think that a house that's near any of the mounds probably much more likely to say I have a haunting, but I don't know for, I don't know for sure. I have some magnetic maps of um, the Maryland area because I was trying to figure out local areas 
they might have UFO activity, but it was hard to read the map, so I don't have the expertise, but um, John Keel wrote that um, UFOs tend to also show up a lot in areas with magnetic anomalies, so I do think that there's a tie between paranormal activity and um, excess geomagnetic energy and it coming up from the ground. Any other questions? Chris. Uh, actually, our, our friend Steve, he, he's he's kind of the reason we're using a pseudonym because I don't want to reveal the person's real name. Um, he claims that he, he's had encounters with the uh, he calls them the, the tall blind uh, pretty people. Because he, he's not real familiar with, with all the UFO lingo about you know the Nordic aliens and stuff like that, but he does claim to have had run-ins with uh, those type of aliens in North Central Pennsylvania, uh, particularly at uh, George B. Stevens Dam. Have you feel there's uh, any type of connection between these lines here and what they see in Ireland? Um, I'm not really familiar with the ones they see um, over in Ireland, but uh, there probably is a connection. Okay, thank you very much.